Remember when you were in high school and you used to doodle in class? Maybe you really enjoyed drawing the way I did. Maybe you filled up notebooks with sketches and drawings that popped in your head. Maybe like me, you drew your own comic books or you took inspiration from video games and you tried to draw what your own games would look like. The dreams and optimism of youth when sketched out on a pad of paper are raw and wonderful, aren't they? They represent untarnished idealism and passion, and even though they might be rough, they represent a love of creative expression that, honestly, goes unmatched into adulthood. Because becoming an adult accepting responsibilities such as having a job and paying bills means sometimes setting aside hobbies and passions, and with that our youthful creative fires begin to dim. But imagine if you took those creative fires from your younger days, and you were able to channel them into the work you chose to do as an adult. Okay, there's some of you kids looking at this and wondering, what the fuck are we looking at here? Well, you're looking at one of the strangest, weirdest, yet most compelling first-person shooters a high schooler ever made. Oh yes! You heard that right, kids. Today's game, Ken's Labyrinth, was developed by a high schooler. And not only that, but this high schooler crafted a game engine with interesting and new innovations such as destructible environments and interactable elements that would go on to be the origin of a game engine that would rival id tech. Because you see, the high schooler who created Ken's Labyrinth was a young man by the name of Ken Silverman, and a mere few years after the release of this game, he would go on to create the Build Engine, something you may have heard of. Yeah, that's right, Ken Silverman, creator of the Build Engine, released his first game when he was still in high school, and not only that, got a publishing deal to release it through Epic Mega Games, back when they still published games and weren't in a blood feud with Apple. Ken Silverman is a name that doesn't get nearly enough respect put on it. Silverman was at one time considered John Carmack's biggest rival, up until Tim Sweeney came swaggering along with something called the Unreal Engine. Ken's Labyrinth was originally released on January 1st, 1993 by Ken himself using the company name of Advanced Systems. Somewhere along the line, Silverman attracted the attention of Epic, and in March 1993, Epic published the full version of the game, which had been upgraded drastically between the initial shareware release and retail version, including new enemies, new artwork, and interactive elements. On a funny little side note, Ken's Labyrinth was reviewed in Dragon Magazine, one of the two official magazines for Dungeons & Dragons, and reviewer Sandy Peterson gave the game 2 out of 5 stars. Yeah. That's Sandy Peterson. Now let's definitely be clear about one thing. Ken's Labyrinth absolutely and totally feels like the kind of game a high schooler would make. There's weird enemies, convoluted and chaotic map design, peppy but repetitive music, sometimes brutal difficulty spikes, cartoonish graphics, but it's also chock full of unique elements that would eventually cross over into other build games like Duke Nukem 3D. There's a slot machine that you can play on and even win a payout of up to 200 coins. There's vending machines where you can buy power-ups and upgrades, water fountains that slowly refill health while drinking from them, destructible walls. There's even portals that can warp you back and forth to different areas of the board. Now, as a first-person shooter, Ken's Labyrinth doesn't exactly incite excitement when it comes to the shooting aspect, but it certainly doesn't slouch on the tension of combat either. When I was a kid, I played the shareware version of this game more times than I can remember. My mom wasn't big on the idea of first-person shooters or violent video games in general, but I was nuts for the genre, and this happened to be the most harmless looking one of the bunch at the time. I mean, look at this. This is not gonna make Joe Lieberman's list of most hated violent shooters. But while I've got a deep sense of nostalgia for the first episode, which is what we got for the shareware version, I was never able to purchase the full release back in the day, so now I finally get to see all the cool shit that I didn't get to experience once upon a time. You see, Silverman released the full game on his website as freeware back in 1999, so anyone can download the full version for the one-time cost of absolutely nothing. There's also been source ports made, such as Lab 3D SDL, which is what I'm using to play the game for this review. It's really handy, as the original version is so outdated that Windows 10 looks at it and does that Ryan Gosling gif from Crazy Stupid Love. I did some fiddling with settings, which I would highly recommend, such as turning off the texture smoothing and changing the sound card setting for the music, which makes the experience feel almost exactly like it did back in 1993 for better and for worse. All right, let's start at the beginning. You play as an unnamed character who's been abducted by an alien race called the Zorgons, who love to throw other alien species through a series of mazes and trials in order to see if their planet is worthy of being spared galactic extinction. Of course, no one's ever beaten the maze, but you have some special incentive. They've kidnapped your dog. 
That's right, you see, your dog Sparky was who the Zorgons originally abducted, but then discovered that dogs are like six times smarter than humans are, and were worried that Sparky would be able to get through the mazes and be the first to ever triumph. So then they kidnapped you for the trials instead. Now armed with the knowledge that they've got your dog and the fate of humanity on the line, you set off through a series of labyrinths full of increasingly strange monsters in order to save literally everything. Before we get too deep into the weird of the game, I want to take a quick second to give a particular shout out to the soundtrack, which is all wonderfully done MIDI work, which would be even better if it wasn't so damn repetitive. Each board has its own unique tune, all of it cheery and upbeat, and while there were times when I found myself nodding my head and enjoying the particular track that I was able to listen to, there were also times when the goddamn song really just needed to not be so short and repeat so often, and I, I wish there was a volume slider instead of simply music off or on. Here, have a listen to a couple of my favorites. Your weapons, meanwhile, are just as odd and cartoonish as the game world is. There are only three in the entire game. Jelly bombs, which fire in a straight line, starbursts, which bounce off of walls, and missiles, which will home in on enemies and are twice as powerful as the other weapons. Each of these weapons can be found or purchased multiple times over, through saving up money to buy them at vending machines or hunting for secrets. The more that you gather, the faster you'll be able to fire them. Meanwhile, a fourth weapon-related pickup is the lightning bolt, which increases the range of your weapons. You won't be able to shoot very far or very fast in the early stages of the game, so it is essential that you find these along the way because you're going to want to keep enemies at a distance, and as you hit later labyrinths, you'll need to shoot a lot of them. A whole fucking lot of them. Speaking of enemies, they come in two flavors, melee only and ranged. Now melee only enemies like spiders, bats, bees, whatever the fuck these are, are kind of a joke depending on the difficulty you choose. Well, there's only two difficulties, don't touch me, easy, and ouch, hard. Don't touch me is very literal, as melee only enemies will run up towards you no matter what, but on easy they will literally not attack you. They'll just stand right in front of you waiting for the inevitable. If, however, you're not paying attention, you can walk right into them and they will do a lot of damage to you until you move away. Meanwhile, on hard mode, melee enemies will make a beeline towards you and walk into you and do crazy amounts of damage, so walking into a room full of spiders suddenly turns you into frantically running backwards to prevent even a single one of them from getting at you, because you can and will die within literal seconds if they get their mods on you. And this, of course, could all be happening whilst ranged enemies such as the droids, the Terminator robots, the witches, whatever the fuck these are, are running at you and shooting purple fireballs or electricity at your ass, and... Yeah, yeah, playing on ouch can be a seriously fucking difficult time to the point where I was so low on health that turning any corner was nerve-wracking. Most of the time, ranged enemies have a further range than you do, so you'll be shooting your jelly bombs at them, trying to take them out as quick as possible, but they'll usually get in a fireball or two before they die. So oftentimes, you'll be taking damage no matter what, health bar whittling away steadily over the course of however the fuck long these mazes are. And that doesn't take into account the indestructible enemies, such as the giant animated eight balls and the sentient walking holes? There are holes in the ground that move and you can fall down them. And sometimes they'll fall down a hole as well. Yeah, I'm not gonna try and make any sense of that. But enemies such as the eight balls can't be hurt nor killed, so you need to lead them into the path of a hole in the ground so they fall down and you can go on with your life. Fortunately, aiding you in your quest to save Sparky are some sweet, sweet power-ups that come in two varieties, potions and cloaks. Drinking purple potions increases the amount of damage you do. Drinking green potions makes projectiles reflect off of you and back at your attackers. Gray cloaks will make you invincible, and blue cloaks will cause enemies to die instantly if you walk into them. Power-ups don't last very long, however, so when you find them, you'll want to move around quickly to get the most mileage out of their status effects. On the plus side, if you're lucky enough to find multiple of the same power-up, the length of time that they are active will stack, so you could theoretically stack enough power-ups to last through the course of an entire episode. Yeah, in the final levels of the third episode, I managed to buy enough cray and blue cloaks that they stuck with me all the way to the final boss, which I needed. 
I desperately fucking needed. There isn't a lot of strategy or depth to the combat or the enemies or the power-up system. It's all very straightforward, easy to navigate, which is due in part to the fact that the real draw of the game isn't the combat in and of itself, but rather navigating the fucking labyrinths. Okay, yeah, these levels can get really exhausting after a while. The basic idea is pretty simple. You start at the beginning of the map and need to find the exit. Each level, or board as the game refers to them, ranges from fairly simple mazes to disturbingly complex labyrinths that will take all of your wits to navigate. Unlike Wolfenstein, which we spoke about previously, Ken's Labyrinth has no auto map that you can press tab to see at any given time, but instead provides a static map that appears in various places on the boards, which you can and then use to orient your position and where you need to go. You see that little blinking dot? That's you. And it even moves in real time when you move, which is fucking mind-blowing when you consider when this game was made by a high schooler. Now, these maps are simultaneously helpful and viciously unhelpful. It's great that they're there, and the deeper into the game that I got, the more thankful I was when I could find one. But once the boards get really stupid, it gets incredibly difficult to figure out where you are on the board just from that top-down perspective. While the boards do, for the most part, have a wide variety of wall textures and images that help establish a sense of orientation so you can navigate fairly easily, the later boards of the game begin to slowly and surely become more and more mono-textured, until the titular labyrinth itself itself, which is all one blue texture for the walls that twists and turns in one huge square maze that felt nearly impossible to escape. After a while, my eyes felt as though they refused to focus as I traversed hallway after hallway of the same textures, my brain begging for some kind of change so I could recognize where I was or where I was going. I can't express how fucking mind bleedingly disorienting it is to turn a corner down a hallway that looks exactly like the hallway you just turned away from, only to reach another turn which could possibly be the exact same turn you just made, or it might not, who knows? It all looks the same sometimes. It all looks the same. It all looks the same. It all looks the same! The game does allow you to purchase a compass from the vending machine if you've got the coin for it, but I kept ignoring that item in favor of furthering my firepower, which I genuinely did need. But having the compass to maintain a sense of orientation can and will make your life so much easier as you become insidiously lost within these goddamn boards. No joke, I thought Wolfenstein was convoluted sometimes, but this? This has all the brutality of a massive, massive prank from a high schooler laughing to himself as he sketches out his ideas, knowing full well that someone is gonna have to make their way through this hellish torture machine. I spent hours squinting my eyes and checking corners and shooting at everything for hidden destructible walls or fake walls as I fought against my very sanity trying to make my way through the boards. Wall textures are at least varied in a really amazing way that I don't know I've ever seen in any other FPS game from this era and that makes it so that you can tell where you've been or what areas or places that you need to go visit. But even then, sometimes they would start to bleed into one another in a mind-numbingly, oh god, have I been here already or have I not? Did I check this here? What the fuck? Where, where, where am I? And on top of that, some of the enemies that appear later in the game are fucking ridiculously tough to beat. The bees, for example, appear in groups and will continue to spawn from their hive unless you take out the hive itself, which thankfully drops honey that restores a good chunk of your health bar. But the sheer volume of bees that spawn and continue to spawn if you ignore the hive are ludicrous at best and masochistic at worst. The pirates soak up the most damage out of any enemy, save for maybe the U.S foes that appear in the final levels, but pirates also have the distinct advantage of moving faster and shooting faster than the UFOs. Pirates appear in hordes as well, and sometimes you'll see them stuck inside of walls. If you turn a corner and see a pirate stuck in a wall, and then accidentally shoot at it, the pirate will emerge from the wall and immediately begin attacking you. A new pirate will appear on the wall, and he will emerge if you attack him, on and on, until the wall has no more pirates to dispense. And do not get me started on the mini Andes. Andy is the boss of the second episode, which we'll get to in a minute, but he has little mini-me's that meander about the back half of episode 2, and they are fucking pain in the fucking fuck. They're tiny, so they're hard to see if other enemies are around, and they have the ability to teleport, which means you could lob some missiles at them, but they'll disappear and then suddenly appear back behind you. To make matters worse, they have the fastest firing rate of all the ranged monsters in the entire fucking game, so if you're low on health and there's more than one of these fucks around, be prepared to die if you can't back away or find a way to kill them quickly. Since they're so small, the homing missiles get thrown off and aren't able to lock on properly either, making for double trouble and double frustration. To that extent, however, 
there's an impressive variety of enemies you'll discover throughout the game. Witches, mummies, pirates, robots, frogmen. Every single time you think you've seen them all, something new appears to confound you. There's no real rhyme or reason to what can appear in this game, but I guess I kind of chalked it up to other combatants who'd been kidnapped by the Zorgons and couldn't navigate through the mazes either, so now they're being used to fight you and keep you from finding your way out. Meanwhile, each of the three episodes ends with a boss fight that really, really will test your limits of patience if you don't have the gold to cheese your way through. First up is Zorko, who looks like a stereotypical troll f thing, resting in the center of a fairly simple maze, but he throws fireballs at you. And once you do enough damage to him, his body will somehow just up and fucking disappear and his head will float around for a minute, invulnerable, until he decides to come to a rest and reform his body and you can damage him again. Do enough damage and he'll vanish, replaced by a portal to the next episode of the game, along with your dog, Sparky. Oh, Sparky. Hmm, we'll talk about Sparky soon enough. At the end of episode 2 is Andy, who is the larger version of the mini Andys I've already mentioned. He throws fireballs and moves quickly, but he doesn't teleport like the mini ones do. Instead, damage him enough and he'll turn completely invincible for a few minutes while he is running around shooting more fireballs at you, unable to be hurt. That's a really sticky situation considering the control scheme, which I'll also get to in a second, but overcome Andy and you'll be able to escape the level and find a doghouse where you can store Sparky as you move on to the final episode and the biggest boss yet, Ken, the alien despot who somehow looks exactly like Ken Silverman. Ken even has wall textures of his face sometimes in the boards, and if you shoot them, you'll do damage to yourself for some reason? Look kids, I just play these goddamn games, I don't make sense of them. The lead up to Ken is, interestingly enough, a boss rush in which we get to fight both Zorko and Andy one after the other in order to get a series of keys to unlock doors that take us to Ken, who seems to have a combination of Zorko's fireballs and Andy's invincibility. But there is a way around these otherwise nearly impossible to defeat bosses. It's a cheese maneuver, but it's a desperately needed maneuver. All right, so remember when I said that you can stack power-ups in order to make them last longer? Well, at some point in the boss arenas, there's always a vending machine, and generally speaking, you'll have enough coin to pony up the five cents per power-up necessary for this strat. But you just need to purchase like five or six gray cloaks for invincibility, five or six purple and green potions, and then have at it. The boss fireballs will bounce off of you and back to them, you'll be invincible, and your attacks are stronger. So there's less need to worry about being vulnerable in a fight where the environment, the enemies, and the entire control scheme are working against you. Because, kids, let me tell you, the biggest downside to playing Ken's Labyrinth these days is the fact that the arrow keys are pretty much the only way to play it. Oh, keyboard only controls. Arrows to move, left control to fire, space to use items, and right control if you want to strafe. No dedicated strafing here, kids. No matter how much you want to try to rebind controls, we are using the arrow keys, like it or not. The tank controls of FPS gaming. Ugh, there's a... There's a certain primal back to basics aspect of utilizing this control scheme nowadays as kind of a way of relearning what we all had to go through back in the day when games like these were more of an oddity than an actual genre. And I have to admit, playing Ken's Labyrinth in the manner that I used to play brought me way back to a very specific time in life when things were much simpler. A time of youth and lack of care about the world. I mean, it's not the greatest control scheme and honestly, if I could rebind to WASD, I would. But you know, for the most part, these controls aren't too bad. Frustrating and limited, but not bad. At least if it wasn't for Sparky getting in the way of my goddamn shots all through episode two. You see, kids, episodes one and three have you running about the Zorgans' mazes solo, but episode two is one massive escort mission in which Sparky is running around just behind you at all times, and you have to make sure he makes it to the exit with you, which for the most part is fine. It's really hard to lose him, and he only refuses to follow you if you try to move too far outside the bounds of the board. But if you've got enemies on your ass and you're holding down the down arrow to move backwards and fire at something that's coming at you, well, there's Sparky, dutifully following you, but now in the way of your shots, blocking you from hitting the monsters. But the monsters can shoot through Sparky and hit you. I had way too many unfair deaths just because I couldn't accurately shoot at the motherfuckers shooting at me because Sparky was in my motherfucking path. <laughs> Fucking fuck! <sighs> Yeah, that shit was frustrating. About halfway through the episode, I figured out that if I was quick enough, I could trap Sparky behind a door if I closed it at the right time. So I started locking him in a nearby room that I could easily find again so I could go explore the boards and then come back to get him once I'd made significant progress. I'll tell you though, once I beat episode two, I was so, so fucking relieved. Exhausted and relieved. 
but at the end of the day, when you take into consideration just how awkward the controls can be, how overlong and convoluted the boards will become, and how frustrating the game becomes all throughout episode 2, for all of the things that go against Ken's Labyrinth, preventing it from becoming an absolute classic that must be played by lovers of the history of the genre, there's an elegant simplicity on display when you play this game. From the wonderfully repetitive MIDI soundtrack that sounds like Windows screensaver music, to the detailed and cartoonish sprite work of the enemies, to the unexplainable sensation of running down a 2D hallway and watching the walls move past you, Ken's Labyrinth exemplifies a time of classic gaming where less was not only more, but was also kind of expected. At the time, Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis and arcade machines had far, far better graphics than PC games did. Hell, PC games were laughable in their downgraded state of affairs. Being a PC gamer back in 1993 was way, way more nerdy than being a console gamer. To an extent, it still kind of is. But back then, we were playing games for the content and gameplay on PC, not for the graphics. They were experiences that took us just a little bit deeper than console games of the era did, despite not being nearly as flashy or action-packed as console games were. Older PC games hold a special place in the heart of those who grew up with them. Quality be damned, because we understood that those were the best that we could get at the time. Games like Doom and Quake and Half-Life absolutely terraformed the landscape of PC gaming, in terms of graphics and gameplay and quality gaming in general. But here, Ken's Labyrinth? Even though it's through the lens of a high schooler, Ken's Labyrinth exemplifies what PC gaming was back in that time period. Simple, awkward, frustrating, straightforward, love it or hate it experiences, which we latched onto no matter what because this was all we could get. Sure, the times and the games changed and got better and soon PCs would become the benchmark for high speed, high quality graphics and gaming, but in the beginning we took what we could get. And this? If Doom was like seeing Star Wars for the first time, Ken's Labyrinth was like Dark Star, a glimpse of things to come, in a genre that was getting ready to expand, in a media that was getting ready to explode. Ken's Labyrinth may not be a true classic in the same way that Wolfenstein is, and the replayability may not nearly be the same, but wow, it holds a place in my heart and will always make me feel like a kid again every time I play it. Ken's Labyrinth gets a 6.5 out of 10, and may God bless Ken Silverman. Alright kids, this game and Wolfenstein were two games that highly influenced my taste in gaming once upon a time, but our next stop on the history train is a shooter that I always held an interest in playing, but never actually got around to doing so. And now, now that modern technology and fan-made source ports exist, I'm exceedingly excited to jump into. So, pack your bags kids, next time we're going to outer space and hunting aliens of gold. Stay hydrated, and stay safe out there. I'll see you next time.